Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Cloud Architects Podcast. Today, we have a really, really good discussion with Ernie Anderson, who is the uh, Vice President of US Services at Kodelsky Security. Ernie's been working in the security space for a long, long time, um, and particularly interested in, in data security. And we felt like it would be a really good discussion to talk about data security, what it is, why we need it, um, and, and all of that. And uh, Nick, what do you think? I mean, great discussion. Wonderful. What I love the most is that he kept on reiterating that a tool is not a process, but we went quite left field on some areas, and I think this was a fun show. What do you think, Warren? Yeah, don't buy stuff. <laughs> I love it. I think it was also great to see somebody who's so heavily invested in security, mm. but not super paranoid. Like, mm. you know, he made some comments about the things that he's worried about and the things that he's not worried about. And not a tinfoil guy. Exactly. And so the classification is very important before you apply the control to it. And that's what makes it the pro program. So I found that incredibly interesting. And I hope you guys enjoy it. Enjoy the show. <laughs> yeah, and there. starting with laughter right out of the out of the gate um good morning Ernie. hey thanks so much uh for for joining us uh how is the weather in san diego this morning uh it's san diego so the standard is it's 75 and sunny it is gorgeous out. <laughs> i was expecting that answer so that's awesome <laughs> hey we're so excited to have you so excited to have you on the show uh it's um it's been a long time coming. I think we've we've sort of tried to schedule this a few times now, and and we've talked about it even even more. So uh, super glad to have you on the show. We also have Warren back, which is great. So Warren's mm -hmm. here, um, and Nick is here, of course, the ever smooth. And data security is top of mind today. And I think data security is top of mind for everyone at the moment, anyway, right? And it has been for well since really everyone got forced to work from home. And it's it's interesting to kind of hear people's takes on on that um and Ernie you've you, you've got a bit of experience in that in that area don't you oh man I sure do I started focusing on data specifically as a security domain and oh man I want to say 2010 so I've been looking at it for about 12 years now uh through through a couple of different companies um and then making my own spin on how we secure data so I've been looking at it for a while okay yeah can I ask what does that even mean? Because you know, oh, if so I have a firewall, that. I'm I'm secure, right? So I have no wait, I have hold a on, firewall. hold on. It is it is more like what is data? Oh yeah, let's let's do that. Like okay, so like what is data? How do I classify that? And why is it important to me? And why is it important to my bank? Like what becomes data and what is like isn't data? Okay. Oh man, that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, I mean, there's a lot of ways to look at this. So, so I look at data when you're building a program, I think there's, there's probably two angles you want to look at it. There, there's the form of data. So you've got your structured data, which is typically things in, you know, databases mm -hmm. um, in a consistent format that it's, that it's stored in. Um, you've got unstructured data, which is things like your, your Microsoft documents, um, mm -hmm. Things that are sitting on your desktop, typically, you know, image files, things like that. And then I even break them into different uh, categories, which isn't really, I'd say, the type of data. But like I'm looking at it towards cloud data and then mm -hmm. Hadoop. So when I'm building programs, I'm looking at those four buckets. And I would say mainly because of the ways that you protect them. So the, the tools that you're implement, implementing to monitor, these, monitor data in those places and in those formats is very different. So like mm -hmm. what you're gonna monitor with the database is gonna be very different than what you're monitoring with someone's workstation. And then mm -hmm. as we're finding that the infrastructures are migrating out of traditional on-prem and to off-prem, now those traditional technologies that we had also don't work. So now you're looking at different controls to protect that mm -hmm. data. So that, there's one facet that I'm looking at is really more how you implement controls I would say the other way you got to look at it is, you know, not all data is the same. So you have to come up with some type of taxonomy or classification levels to really say, you know, hey, what, what do I really care about? Um, and so that's a lot of the things that we do or I've been working on when I build out programs is, is to work with the business to figure out what are really, you know, you hear crown jewels all the time. But what's like if we actually lose this data, it could potentially put us out of business. And, and those are the things that, that you need to think about is the different classification levels. And part of that is, as you think about controls, um, 
you know, you want to put commensurate controls in place because it doesn't make sense to protect your environment at that top level mm -hmm. crown jewels, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, classification level because it's just too expensive. Um, you know, the only places that can really do that are the DOD that have unlimited funds, but most companies in the commercial space just, just can't afford to put that protection everywhere. So that classification level is going to give you, um, you know, it's going to guide the, the controls that you put a, put in place really based around risk. So I, I, that was probably a long way of answering your question. <laughs> no, but that was, right. that was, that was so like I said, it's a fairly loaded. Uh, it's a loaded. That's a, that's a great answer to a loaded question, and I think there's a lot to kind of unpack there, right? To use to use Nick's favorite word, um, because when when we talk about classifications, we're talking about as a business looking at my data and saying, okay, well, this stuff here is my crown jewels, as as you mm. as you called it, and this is like confidential or highly confidential data, right? Versus something that is, you know, a, a lunchtime menu that gets circulated perhaps on email or as a flyer like that. That's something that anyone in the public can see. And we don't really care as a business. We wouldn't call that data classified, right? That would just be, you know, public data. And so we're filling in everything in between. Is that, is that kind of a good understanding of, of the classification? Yeah, I mean, so typically, you know, we don't want to see anybody trying to classify more than four tiers because it just gets yep. complicated and there's really no difference. You start muddying the water and if there's no difference in controls or what people need to do, it, it's why? Why do that? I would say the other the other thing that we try to avoid or what I've tried to avoid with, you know, people I've worked with is um, you, you don't need to boil the ocean and, and classify everything. You can start with the most critical you know, sets of data, try mm -hmm. to find it and then secure that and then work your way down. There's, you know, half of that data, you, you, you probably don't, you don't need to run around and put in, uh, implement controls on the, on the menu, the lunch menu, as you talked about. Mm -hmm. So how do you look at, how do you really prioritize and focus on, you know, what, what are those top tier crown jewels? How do you figure out what they are? Where mm -hmm. are they? Mm -hmm. And then a, a lot of it's just like expectations of your, your user population. If you're handling this, you mm -hmm. know, here's our expectation for that top tier. So typically it's top tier would be intellectual property, the stuff that you're in business for that you do better than than everybody else should be in that top tier. Your mm -hmm. second tier ends up being usually regula uh, regulated data. So you get into the PCI information, the PHI, things like that. I always get nervous there, when I is see- there where, Is there where like GDPR and things would sit? So, because obviously it's coming to pay now and it's like, okay, well, I have this guy's data. I didn't actually really want it, but I have it now. And now there's a law that states that I have to keep it safe, but I don't actually care about it. So would that be in there? Yeah, that, I would look at that as like the next tier. And I always okay. get nervous when I see that as the top tier. Because I'm like, mm. you're not in business to be compliant. Yeah. You're in business because you're doing something <laughs> that nobody else does. Mm. Like yeah. that's, that, the secret sauce that makes that up should be your most sensitive data. Okay. That makes sense. So I think so. I think so. Essentially, we're, we're we've understood that we want to protect our data, and and we've kind of walked down this path of saying, uh, one, we first need to find it. So we need to figure out is it sitting is it on a file server somewhere and you know in the environment? Is it in the cloud in some sort of cloud storage? Uh, is it in a database somewhere? You know, on the on prem or in the cloud? And wherever it is, we've identified that we have this data, and the next step is to understand what the makeup of the data is, right? Is is this big database that we have, is this our top secret, you know, seven herbs and spices recipe to KFC? Or is it, uh, again, just something that is, you know, not important at all, right? And so we've, we've, so we've gotten that, that far. Now, I think one of the challenges I think that I've sort of come across in the space is that folks tend to, organizations tend to kind of, they get, swindled by the marketers, right? And they end up going, well, oh, this tool looks like this is going to be the exact thing that we need and, and we're just going to go buy this thing and then I'm just going to clickety-click and then boom, protection. That, that's a bit misleading, is not is it not? Because you can't just run after, as with anything in, in, in the you know, tech and the work that we do, the tool is the, the end result of many other processes that come ahead of that. You can't just go from like zero to tool and expect everything's gonna, gonna work, right? Is that is that a fair assumption or a fair kind of assessment? I think I think that's fair with a lot of security products, not just data. <laughs> right. uh, we can start there. Um, but you know, if you rewind to, geez, I, I would say when I when I first got into this, so like 2010-ish, it, it was all about DLP, so data loss prevention mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. And 
you, you would always run into programs that basically went nowhere. All they did was monitor and it became a compliance check in the box. And it's, mm. you know, honestly, the, the technology is fairly trivial, um, mm. but nobody's thinking about, okay, we found this. Now, what do we do? Like, do, do we quarantine it? Do we delete it? Who makes the decision? You know, if someone's asking for an exception, how, how does that work? Um, and then honestly, if you get into, you get into things like intellectual property, like someone needs to define that. So once you get out mm. of like the, the the canned rule sets that are talking about you know compliance data, that works pretty well. But if you're trying to stop code from leaving, you mm. really need to groom those tools, and you need someone from the business telling you, uh, you know, what's critical and what to look for. Mm. Um, and I think along those lines, so so I got in the in, in the point. My view was, it, you know, it really is about the program. Yeah, it, it, specifically when it was DLP, it's like you got to think about the program. It's not just implementing the tools. The tools are trivial. The other thing, too, is there's other controls that you can put in place. So DLP does not equal a data protection program. So there's other mm -hmm. things you could put in, like database activity monitoring. You know, now we're looking at CASBs. And you really have to look at that ecosystem of tools um, uh, and how they work together to get the protection levels you need. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> so it's not just uh, let's click a button. You know, DLP is great. Who doesn't want to lose? Nobody wants to lose data. So yeah, I want that. But you you got to think of how that works. Oh, one other thought on this too was, um, you know, I'm working with a customer right now, and uh, you know, we're trying to determine risk levels and we're trying to figure out IP and you know where it sits in our priorities. And a lot of the times too, because security is running these tools. The, the business is looking at them to make those decisions on, on you know, what's important. And that doesn't make sense. I mean, security is here to serve the business and enable the mm. business. The mm. business needs to tell us what the priorities are, and then we will implement the controls to protect based on those risk levels and what, what they say is important. And it's not security. I mean, we're, we're, we're techies in here that are, that are helping, but the, it ultimately it's a business decision. I have a question around data. Or, or let's uh, let me separate data in terms of the files that I have, the data that I have in databases, and then let me look at employee behavior and the metadata that is generated by the cloud services that I use as data that is valuable to me as a business and that I also need to defend somehow and secure. And if I look at what used to be, um, well, we, we spoke about in the show uh, a couple of weeks ago when we, we spoke about AI and how Office 365 AI is generating data about Warren, the employee. What is Warren doing? And what does his calendar look like? He joins meetings. He has time that's booked out for productivity and AI tracks that and it generates data around that. Now that is data that the company owns. So Warren's employer owns that. But how do we how do we secure behavioral data about this person that's Warren? And it's effectively metadata. And I know this is a very um, uh, potentially um, obscure question or, or left field question. However, we're getting away from the, the company data that I have in a database, which highly structured and I've got documents and that kind of thing, to metadata where we've got these AI services that are generating information about the employees. And how do we measure the value of that data? And then therefore, how do we secure that? And how do we take all of that, everything that we've spoken about, and how do we apply that to metadata that AI is generating literally by the truckload at the moment and will be ever increasing? Uh, I think, again, another good loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like wondering if you got all that. <laughs> He's taking so, notes. <laughs> I think there's a, I look at that as a two part question. So there's one, there's And, the and it's not a loaded data. question in terms of it's going down any vendor path. It's a case of, Ernie, this is what you're doing for a living, right? And as a data professional, if I was going to engage and say, Ernie, I, I have all this metadata being generated about my employees. How do I think about security in that context? Well, so. Let's think about the roles. Let me start with the roles I, I see in data. So 
you typically there is a data governance group that's going mm -hmm. through and making decisions on where data is stored, where data is processed. Do we want to collect these types of data? You know, how are we going to monetize data? Right. So mm -hmm. there's data governance. Data security is then working with those groups to understand, you know, data governance is setting the priority for data. Mm -hmm. Data security is trying to figure out how we, we lock it down. Mm -hmm. And then usually there's a legal legal HR component to it of like they're interpreting the laws and trying to say, you know, what, what can and can't you do with, with that data? So I think in the scenario you just came up with, there's there's kind of a, a piece of each one, right? So mm. data governance could be, it, and it's it, it depends on how we're actually looking at that meta, metadata. So if it's customer metadata and how we're looking at how a customer interacts with a site or a site or you know our user experience, that's a data governance thing of deciding we're going to collect that data because we want to monetize it. Then I think the next piece is once you have that data, it goes into the, it's now it's just data. So you have to determine where is it on your classification levels. So if it's at the point where you have something detrimental, where again, if it gets lost and it would be terrible for the business, it's probably a, a high tier data level. So you're going to go apply um, high tier controls to protect it. Then I also think there's a component of, you know, from the legal HR side, and I, I've got customers that I've talked about as well. I'm like, guys, I can be big brother. I can monitor the, you know what, out of your employees. I mean, we could record their sessions and we can monitor everything. Do you want to? I mean, uh, and and is HR okay with that? I mean, because you could get to the point where you're reading, you know, people's personal emails. Um, you could be looking at their bank accounts. So like, do I, do I actually want to capture and make a bigger problem of capturing your personal bank account information in my tooling, you know, and you're, and you're not a bank. And so I think you have to figure out how far do you want to take that in, into mm -hmm. being big brother. Um, mm -hmm. But again, I think they're, they're different within those groups. Everybody's got to say, um, I think your security guys want to monitor everything because they want to know what's going on, but that's where you have the checks and balances of legal mm -hmm. saying, well, I can't have, you, you know, uh, uh, Joe, security mm -hmm. guy, just you know, reaching in your computer and looking through everything to see if you're doing anything bad. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we need those controls when we build out programs. So uh, I, I would also say I I think data programs normally we start with uh, let's protect the data. Then it gets to how do we look at anomalous behavior, and then I think the next advanced step is how are we looking for insider threat for people, you know, really doing something bad? Mm -hmm. um, I think AI will be a component of that. I don't know that we're quite there yet. Um, I eventually it will help us, but I think there's a lot of research going into it, a lot of money. And I don't, I don't know that we're totally mature in that space, uh, yet. Um, but I think ultimately that's where, that's what I would like to eventually build is start with the data program ultimately gets insider threat. But then I think you have to think about what data feeds you actually want to take in, into that program and how far are you willing to go for investigations and actually starting to monitor people? And you know, the, uh, 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 geographic laws and rules are going to be mm -hmm. very different on that. You know, yep. uh, Europe is going to say no to a lot of that, while the U.S. it's pretty much you can kind of do whatever you want. Tip California, because <laughs> <laughs> you know, in California you can't do anything. <laughs> I keep bagging on the Californians, and you're in California. I don't know why I do that. It's so weird. Maybe I've been in Texas for too long. It's just crazy. <laughs> but, I grew up in Chicago, so you know, only but I've been here half my life, so I'm only personally right. offended. <laughs> gotcha. Offended Sorry. <laughs> Should try harder next time. Um, something that I I think that there's like a theme to all of this, though, right? Which is which is change, and I mean this this gets us in in all aspects of of, of technology, but I think it's very true here as well. Is if you've gone through this crazy data you know protection program like in 2018. Right, which is fairly recent, I guess, in terms of these programs, because these things can take a very long time to implement. But let's say you you kind of went through in 2018 and you implemented data, you know, data, data security, and you're you're quite comfortable that you're protecting everything that's important to you as a business. Well, hey, the world's changed a lot since 2018, right? And now, yeah. as Nick, you know, you, you mentioned the metadata thing, right, and the tracking of signals within all cloud services. Obviously, Microsoft do this, but everyone else does too. Like that's a new thing. So it's an well, Microsoft have a product, Chris. It's called Microsoft Viva. Yep. Yep. And and how do we apply data security to that when it's um, it's about me, right? And I'm talking to any the the data professional, and it's not in a database that I could um, export, import, or switch off. Right? It's in a service. And I think what's important here is one from the customer perspective, is to continue to evolve that program, right? We're no longer in a world where things are static, where you implement a set of controls one time and they're gonna be 
good for the rest of the entirety of the business. Like mm -hmm. these things need to be revisited and revised continuously because there's a continuous evolution of product, uh, you know, and service that's being used by organizations. Mm -hmm. And so we need to, we need to go through this process constantly of saying, okay, well last year when we, or last, you know, last quarter when we evaluated our, you know, our secret sauce or our crown jewels, um, we had this, like, has there been any addition to that in the last quarter? Mm. I, I, mm. I really think that a lot of these things have to become a continuous process, right? Like almost a DevOps type process of like continuous involvement. Otherwise, exactly right. You're just never gonna you're never gonna be on top of it. But from a from a customer an organization perspective, so you need to monitor that. But then from a vendor perspective, and we can pick on Microsoft, like when you're bringing out tools like this, which are in your mind great and innovative. Mm. Like very very cool, and I'm sure there are a lot of fantastic use cases for it. But you also have to be able to provide the controls to mm. your customers to be able to, you know, secure the the, the data that is being generated by these services. Mm. Because mm. otherwise, all you're doing is exposing the customer, right? Indeed. So, um, uh, and I just want to give Ernie a um, while I'm still beating on this drum. There is this thing of. Uh, we don't inspect the network traffic because we spent a lot of time um, in, in the network arena. Previously, we used to secure network traffic. And when we send traffic to Office 365, we don't inspect it and we shouldn't because it breaks all kinds of things. Because Microsoft is a trusted partner. That's why we trust them with our data. However, if I put my data into SharePoint, I can still apply data security controls, governance process around that. So now that Microsoft is generating data about me and that data is actually available to my business and it does things like give me manager insights so that I know the mental health of my teams as an example, as a general indicator, because we're talking about Viva and what Viva does in employee, employee um, um, evaluation. And, and that's one of the things that Viva does. So it's generated all this, this data for me and it's now sitting in that box that I call sitting with a trusted partner and I no longer have direct control of my data like I do with SharePoint. How do I think about that in a different way? Um, and so do I, the I, words I, blind trust fit into this box in any way? I mean, I, I I don't think there's any security professional that that would say blind trust is a is a is a word. It's just not in our vocabulary. Um, <laughs> and I, I think in in your example there, you know, do we trust the uh, you know? So my take is I think Chris brought up a point around like how do you find data, how do you track it, and how are you using it? So what are the flows mm -hmm. of that data? So I think in your example, you know, you can we can say we're not going to inspect on the network side. And I think you want to follow the flows of the data and look at each hop and make sure you have adequate protection. So now your point is we now have this data sitting with this third party vendor. How, how do we trust that they're they are handling this data appropriately? Um, I think there's a couple of ways you can look at it. I mean, there there are tools out there now where you 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 can use these services. Like I, I use uh, I use OneDrive, but I encrypt everything in Boxcryptor before it goes up there. So, I mean, I hold the keys, it encrypts before it goes up there. There's nothing that, that Microsoft can do analytically on that data other than just look at the file sizes and, and what's in there, but they're not actually looking at the content. They can see my behavior of going in and out of that. Um, I would say on top of that, I mean, the, a lot of it now just comes down to your vendor management programs mm -hmm. and frankly, legal. Like, I, I think that there's, you have to look at the contractual terms when you sign up to that. Um, if you're buying a service, there are expectations of controls and what they can actually do with that data. Um, I also think what's nice with GDPR is that's actually enforcing some of that where people just can't mm. just take this stuff without you knowing and, and you know, your right to, to be forgotten and things like that. Obviously, in the U.S., we're, we're not quite there with a little bit of California. <laughs> um, so I think you have to look at that. And I, I think you can put protective controls to prevent mm. that if you are not OK with it. Um, and then the other option is, um, you know, this is why we want com competitors in the marketplace. If, if, if the vendor is not meeting your requirements, you, you find a different vendor. Mm, mm. That also leads me to my next question, and this is the this is the part where we get personal, right? So, <laughs> are you are you are you that dude that takes that approach to everything in life, right? So, you say you use OneDrive, but you encrypt it first, right? But now, like, I'm the guy that I'm like, okay, well, it's encrypted when I put it in OneDrive, so it's kind of okay. So, I also use an iOS device, right? So. 
do you use an Android device? Do you have some sort of endpoint protection on it? How do you secure your Windows machine? Do you use Linux? Like, so there's, there's this personal aspect because you're dealing with this sort of data all the time, all day, every day when it comes to a company, right? Assume zero trust. There's always a breach. Everything's gone to hell. Everybody is a bad person. Now, <laughs> to live in Warren's hand. <laughs> how, do I, how do I then protect myself against that? And like, okay, wait, do you even have a cell phone? A <laughs> do, do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, but, but that's a great, I mean, that's a great, and I, and I, I know this was, you were talking to, you know, to Ernie here, but my, my take on this as well is, you know, you get, there are a lot of folks who are like super paranoid about a lot of things, right? And they're like, well, I, you know, I'm not going to have, a home automation system that can listen to me. Like I'm not going to have an Alexa yeah. device in my house. I don't use WhatsApp. And and no. I yeah, I don't want to use WhatsApp because it's owned by Facebook. And actually I was like that for a very long time. <laughs> and I still refuse to use Facebook Messenger. But okay, let's move away from me. Right. But but I, at some point you kind of have to get to the thing where you go, okay, if I can't trust uh, like WhatsApp or Facebook. I can't right, then, then can I trust any of the cell phone providers, right? Because like cell exactly. technology is so old that you. you've got to th think that it's that, that it's massively insecure right but yeah i think we're also in a world now where the younger generation they they're okay to make the trade-off right they're like mm. well it's okay i'm mm. going to consume this free instagram service because i like looking at pictures mm. and i don't really care how much of my data my personal information is leaked or taken by by you know uh by facebook right and it because I'm getting something in return. Whereas guys like us look at this and go, uh-uh, like I'm not going to, you know, I'd pay for a service if I knew that it was going to be. But, uh, but is it is it that detrimental is my question. And this is why I ask somebody that's in data security, for instance. I mean, like, yes, I know there's some bad people out there. And sometimes I like to assume the best in people, which mm. is probably the worst. But is <laughs> my photos on Instagram, like, and they get hacked or distributed or whatever the case may be, is that detrimental to my life? Like, is it, like, I mean, yes, there's reputational damage when it comes to a customer losing data that perhaps belongs mm -hmm. to other people. So, like, if Facebook gets breached or whatever the case may be, is, but, like, let's say I get, or my mother gets, like, what's the word, uh, fished, whatever the case may be is, and they take her Facebook account or whatever. I know what sort of can happen there, right? They mm -hmm. sort of work their way up the chain to her bank account. But as far as somebody getting my Facebook photos, am I really that concerned about it? Or what do you, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, Should we start I, the question I, with um, Ernie? <laughs> how much tinfoil is wrapped around your house? Yeah, well, yeah, that was the question to start with. Well, so you know, getting back to the personal side of it, so I I, I am an Android guy, um, and uh, it's not a security thing. It's because uh, I grew up in an IBM house. That, you know, a funny story, and I'll try to, I'll tell it quickly. But I grew up in an IBM house. My my mom worked for IBM for uh, 20, 25 years, and so we just did not do Mac products more just because of the competitive nature of it. And uh, so you know, I've always had Androids. Even to this day, she still is an Android. She does not do Macs. Um, and I actually went to, I ended up working at IBM because you know, the recruiter reached out to me, you know, I grew up with the brand, um, and, uh, <laughs> I got there and, and believe it or not, I was issued a Mac is my computer. My first <laughs> Mac ever came from me going to work at IBM and my mom almost like fell out of her chair. Because was it was like, more secure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't believe it. I always, I always think that's a funny story. But yeah, because story. of that, uh, I, I am an Android guy just because that's what I started using and Google Voice. I really like Google Voice and the integrations. That, that's why I'm an Android guy. So wow. I am along those lines, like I'm not I'm not super paranoid, but I think it's also, again, security is, I think, more of a risk discussion. And I have a higher tolerance for risk. Um, I would also say, you know, I'm realistic about these things. Like one, one thing that always drives me bananas is people are always so concerned about like their credit card getting stolen. I mm. could care less. I mean, like, unless I have liability where they say you have to pay for all the charges, which most of the time you yep. just, I, I, you know, I monitor, I, I sync my bank accounts on Quicken. I, uh, you know, I see if there's crazy charges there are, I cancel and get a new card. Like who cares? <laughs> you know, but if, 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 if the liability was pushed to me, then I would actually probably care more. <laughs> right. um, and so, you know, like 
I'm not worried about, you know, credit card information, for example. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm, I'm a guy who like, uh, I'll leave the keys in my boat. Cause I don't think what are the odds someone's going to go steal my boat and go somewhere really far with it. And maybe I get a joy rider, but I, I think the odds are low. So I am not a tinfoil guy. I, um, but I also understand the risk when it happens and, mm. you know, stuff in the house, like I have insurance, I defer the risk. Mm. I have, I have, you know, uh, good insurance, <laughs> I have low deductibles. So I, I just think from a risk perspective on a lot of these things that mm. I'm covered and I think about it in that way. Mm. And I think that's mm. a, that's that's a that's an interesting that's a very good answer to that question, right? Is is on the personal side as well. I think it does make sense for folks to kind of evaluate the risk, right? Like if you're a high profile mm. person, um, perhaps your risk profile is very different Perfect. to me, right? Who doesn't even have any cigar, by the way? But who who, <laughs> who uh, like? But I but you know I, but I also think there's 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 the intent behind it right mm. if someone the person who's going after your stuff is it a, a, just a, a, like a, an opportunity like they just happen to come across your data your your you know credentials in a breach and they're just checking it out right yeah probably not 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 much going on there but again like if you're if you're if you're being targeted the intent different story the whole way is a different story and so mm. you know my take on this has always been like you know why make it easy for for anyone right like you know, there's no reason not to use two factor on on anything that supports everything. It. Yeah, it's just you oh. know. So, yeah. but you know, again, I think I think that I do look. You know, I, certainly me personally looks at I look at things a little differently to just most Joe public because yeah, because I you know we work in the space right. So one, we understand how technology can go wrong, but two, we also like to look at things a little bit more you know mm. from a security perspective. So that's kind of yeah. But yeah. again, do we overcook it? I think in sometimes, many instances, probably, uh, right? Sometimes we overcook it. <laughs> it's, it's, you, I've had my Netflix account stolen and my password changed. And, you know, from a consumer point of view, that was inconvenient. I managed to find the... They started uh, recommending more cooking shows for you, Nick. <laughs> well, uh, actually, then you'd be surprised how many cooking shows we watch. But um, the cooking and travel, that's, that's, a, that's a very interesting recipe. <laughs> But you know, because we 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 in the industry, it was relatively easy for me to find the disposable um, email account that the attacker was using, and then I found the IP address, and then I found the address in the UK, and um, for very little money, I'm willing to share that publicly. And then I thought, well, what am I going to do with this information besides show yeah. my kids? Look, this is how yeah. easy it is to find someone, and they yeah. all went, wow. And then Ooh. I just changed all the passwords. Uh, maybe temporarily inconvenience the email account because I could in interesting ways. And then mm. I, you know, I got my Netflix account back with a complex password that a password spray attack is not going to compromise so easily next time. But as a consumer, I would have been like, oh gosh, I need to change from my password from January to February and hope no, no one finds that. Mm. Uh, you know, it's courses for courses. I've got different rules. I think to Ernie's point about risk, to my bank account passwords than I do mm. I have on my Netflix password. I also understand about escalation of privilege and sideways movement. So I don't use my Facebook account to authenticate anything except maybe Strava because it's convenient. Yeah. And because Agreed. I don't I don't see it as a secure identity provider. But I do see my AOD credentials in a completely different light. And I see how I use Google as identity provider in a different light. So it's, you know, it's, it's relative risk. And um, I don't think Joe Public knows about that at all. It's like, oh, Facebook is convenient. So I'll just use it to authenticate for everything. Mm -hmm. And I've got a, a four-letter password and no MFA. And I don't mm -hmm. know that I need to worry about that. And that's a very different discussion from how is Facebook using my data, right? And <laughs> if I'm nefarious, I would hack your Facebook account, learn stuff about you, and I would use that to craft a very long-running attack to take advantage of your uh, personal information, your banking information, your family's banking information. And a friend of mine's... Um, Parent, see, it's people like you that make things difficult, Nick. No, no, but a friend of mine's parent got <laughs> hacked, and their relationship <laughs> to their adult daughter was exposed 
in a social engineering attack where the bank, in inverted commas, was phoning and saying, we know all this information about you and you need to reveal the last bits of your banking information. And actually, because all of this relational data was there and understood, this mm -hmm. long-running attack was used to commit financial fraud. How do you mitigate against something like that? And that's a question for Ernie. I mean, so you talk about the program and where you draw the line. So as far as an employee is concerned, when you're assuming zero trust the whole time, those sorts of social engineering attacks can't necessarily happen. I mean, you know, like... Sorry, Warren, are you asking Ernie the question in terms of personal data or company data? Because no, so I'm asking where, where the... Where, um, where the line is, right? So when it comes to the personal, so the engineering attack, compromising personal person, but then adding access to company data. So you've been compromised okay. personally, but now the company used. has a reputation. Okay. So you've got to now obviously put the controls in from the company side mm -hmm. that if that happens, stop it dead in its tracks. So for instance, if I have to take it like my phone, right? My phone has it, got so many policies on it because it's got Microsoft stuff on it that I can't like do anything with my phone. I can't even unlock my watch without my phone. Because <laughs> it's like, they won't let me unlock my watch because my watch could be something that could be compromised in this point. So when you're working on a program, how do you draw the line and how do you make it that secure, but without hindering the productivity of the person. Yeah, uh, and it's something we, we you know, a lot of people wrestle with all the time, uh, or a lot of organizations. Again, it gets back to the data governance side. I think the business coming back of what's acceptable, because especially now mm -hmm. and necessity. I mean, you, you know, you're you're at a you're at a bigger organization that's been in this space for a long time, very mature, and frankly, rolling out a lot of the products that are there, so it's easier mm -hmm. to secure, but. If you get down a, a, a five thousand person organization that maybe has, you know, uh, you know, a couple IT guys and like two security people, and then the whole COVID thing happens, and now all of a sudden you got to push people working remotely. Like you might need them to use their personal laptops to to exactly get yeah. this moving. And so you know the business is going to push that. That's where I think again you're going to follow what types of data are moving to those places, and then you're going to think about what controls that you can actually implement. You know, in in beyond just data, just just everything, um, and then make the transition of where you want to go to, to enable that remote working. Um, I do think, uh, like, how much do you need to educate your employees to just be better stewards of their their data? Um, I have actually seen companies now that you know the CISO is going in and just doing training to their board around just like, hey, here's how you should be managing your life around security and things like that, like you know, managing bank accounts, like how do you access that? You know, what should we do, what should you be worried about on, on Facebook and things like that? Mm -hmm. um, and they're, they're extending where it's not, it's not totally the company. Well, it is the company in the sense that you, you don't want your board member or your C-level getting hacked even personally because it could look bad, but I think they're also doing it more just to educate people on what do they need to know. Um, you know, it is interesting that you bring up the topic around parents uh, because I think that's one group very much targeted like even my my dad got one. Uh, it was like uh, one of my good, a uh, 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 spammed email from one of my high school friends that needed money because he was stuck in like Nigeria or something like that. And my dad actually called me and he was like, should we call Jeff and make sure he's okay? And I was like, <laughs> I'm pretty sure he's fine, but if you want to call him, I'm sure he would appreciate a call to hear from you. <laughs> but, you know, there's a lot of new technology that this is, this is overwhelming for, you know, my dad's a, a, a was a tax attorney and he's retired now. And like, this is a lot of stuff coming at him and he wants to be involved in things like Facebook and Instagram to see what the kids are doing. But I mean, it changes all the time. The applications mm. are different. So you, you put in a new way of authenticating. He doesn't know if this is legitimate or not. Mm. I mean, it's it's tough. I mean, we're, we're professionals in it and it, it can be even complicated for us, but like imagine someone in their mid seventies, who's probably a target. Um, it's it's complicated. My answer to them is just if you're if it's an email that you are somewhat questionable about, delete it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> there is nothing that important that comes in an email and don't click any. If it's too good to be true, it probably is. Yeah. <laughs> I think or they'll call you. <laughs> I think that definitely the lines are being blurred. I think this kind of where we're going with this, right? I think the lines are being blurred between mm. personal data and company data or corporate data in some instances, and and also 
like your work day now is 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 a real combination of the two things as well, right? Previously, mm. you go to the office and then everything at the office was Stay work there. activity, and then you go home. I mean, obviously not if you work in IT, but <laughs> um, but nowadays, like folks folks are working from home, so your work day is is a combination of some work activity, then mm. some personal activity sprinkled in. So I think everything's getting blurred. But I think mm. to get back to kind of really the the topic of discussion, Ernie, I think as we kind of look to land the show here. Um, the question I had already in, in, in some way during the show, but as a, like a parting, um, you know, uh, uh, words of wisdom to, to, to anyone listen to this, right? If you're in an organization or let's say I'm in an organization and I realize now I need to do something with my data. And like, I, mm. I want to start, you know, I want to be able to go in front of the board or, or, or tick that compliance box that says data security check. What do you think? Where are like what are your like tips to 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 start this? Like where do I start this journey? And like what does that journey look like for me? Just at a really high level. Yeah. So I mean, I, I think the first piece of advice I would say, temporarily, stop buying stuff. Just stop. Your first answer mm. is not to go and buy tools. And and I'm not saying that you don't need tools, mm. but you know nowadays there's a lot of protections built in. Um, I would say I, I had a, a great guy uh, who used to be on my team that knew Microsoft very well and has taught me uh, very good things about what's coming out on the platform. That was Chris Goosen, by the way, <laughs> um, that there's a lot of functionality that you can you can build in and we can do initial use cases. Let's think about what are your requirements. Let's think about where data is moving and let's think about what you currently have to to address those use cases right so I, I think look at what you have first and see if we can if we can do the protections you need to get the program moving and if we outgrow those tools and we need something else based on requirements then you go buy something but the first answer isn't uh, I need data protection what am I gonna buy I, I, I think first stop that um, I think the other one too is you know for the longest time uh, Chris you had brought up the you go out and do data discovery figure out what your data is. Mm you know, do kind of risk assessments, think about what controls you want to implement. I, I, in the beginning, like that is the textbook way to do it. But the reality is to go and do that big discovery effort is going to take a long time. I mean, it is a program. Mm -hmm. So what you want to do is you do want to do discovery, you know, to a certain extent and think about where your risk areas are. So most of the time now, it's really the cloud. It's, you, you got to be concerned about someone just spinning up some uh, with a credit card, some application or some infrastructure, and now you've got data sitting where you're not expecting it. So you do want to do discovery in that regard of making sure, you know, the whole idea of shadow IT that you're tracking it. But I think on the top, top down approach would be, okay, we can characterize what kind of data we're concerned about. So let's just say it's pre-release financial information. And hey guys, if you have that, you can apply these controls here's how you do it. And you just train the users to understand like, hey, if you want me to protect what you have, these are the mm -hmm. things that are available to you. So they're they're now protecting, you're, you're pushing out to the user community as, as kind of a service catalog to say, hey, mm -hmm. I, I'm worried about this. I don't want it to get it out. Oh, and great security has something and a way I can protect it. I'm gonna go apply that. And mm -hmm. so I think what you wanna do is you both both directions. You wanna let people start kind of protecting their data right away with, with you know, available controls and, you know, we're finding MIP, anything in the, in the usually in the Microsoft space is use it. Like mm -hmm. you have it available, most likely use mm -hmm. that, start there and then do the discovery effort to do the cleanup of legacy. And that's a program that can take time. But I think there's a lot you can do, uh, again, without immediately running out and buying tools, use what you have, start thinking about, you know, prioritize data, look at the crown jewels, don't try to do everything. Mm -hmm. um, and then you build your program down to get all data and you start doing the discovery. Very, I think that's I think a great. I probably went too high. Uh, I went a little lower than I level on that. No, one. that's <laughs> great. I, I think that's super useful. I think someone listening mm, to this can take mm. that away, and that's a really good basis. And I think really key point as well is is the users, right? Because you can have the best program, the most mature tooling, but if you don't bring the users on the journey, they're never going to use it, and it's going to mm. be a failure. And I think we, you know, we can all agree that we see that in every aspect of of tech too. So, yeah, that's that's great. Really good advice. Yeah, for sure. And I think, uh, you know, that was a really, really good place to start as well. And it which leads me to my next question. If there was, so as far as resources go, is there anything that mm -hmm. you particularly use on a sort of day to day basis? Are there certain places you like to go? Is there anything that you would like to plug? I mean, do you have a blog that we can go to and read about all this cool stuff? So, yeah, a bunch of resources people can just sort of use to start there. 
Yeah, I mean, so I, I'm I'm not as uh, big on the blogging. Um, I'm I'm getting new to podcasts, but I, I like it. This is pretty exciting. So maybe hopefully you guys invite me back to I don't know we'll come come up with something else to talk about. Um, I, I, you know, I, I do I do work for a security company, so I work. Uh, I'm the vice president of um, of services for Kanelsky Security. So you know, we we do everything. I I I've focused on data more recently, but now all those domains fall under me as far as rolling out programs. Um, and, and certainly, you know, I, I would like to have a professional discussion if anybody needs help with, with any area, data, data uh, in particular. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, so Ernie Anderson, pretty easy to find uh, out there. And if anybody wants to reach out that way, that's probably a good way. Um, mm. And yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, I think, um, you know, se- security is a, a fun space. Uh, I had a I had a friend a couple of years ago that works for the airlines and and he was saying that you know, the industry itself does not compete on safety. And I think that mm. really applies to security as well. It's been a really fun industry in that there's, we just all need to help. And it's it's mm. competitive, but not really, because there's so much work and everybody needs help. And I, I really enjoy that about this. So, you know, my plug on, if, if people want to talk about data or have further questions, I'm, I'm more than willing to have a discussion around it. Um, I think it's a fun topic and uh, I'm always open to new and innovative ways to, to solve this this problem. Awesome. What an amazing quote from uh, like people. That. Yeah, yeah, I, I like that a lot. That uh, the the industry doesn't compete in security. So from um, a or safety and from a security professional point of view, we shouldn't either. And I think that's an amazing attitude. So uh, Ernie, we thank you so much for the time that you've given us today for coming onto the show, and we do look forward to having you on another episode. So thank you very much. For sure. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure and honor.